I'm Collier Landry. And I'm Brenda Fisher. And this is Moving Past Murder. And on today's Moving Past Murder, it is Halloween. Yes, Brenda, what's going on on Halloween? Well, they've identified one of the unidentified victims of John Wayne Gacy, um, a bigamist, and his ex-wife are going to prison for killing his current wife and her family. And uh, somebody was raped on a Pennsylvania train and people watched and recorded it. Wow, that's a lot to take in. Yes. Well, uh, let's get to it. Okay. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in Richland County history. Dr. John Boyle is accused of killing his wife, Maureen, and burying her body in the basement of his new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. I did not kill Maureen. I never harmed her at all. The 12-year-old son of accused murderer, Mansfield Dr. John Boyle, finally took the stand. As I heard a scream, I heard a thud. It was about this loud. Did the jury in this case find the defendant guilty? I confront my incarcerated father in prison. And finally, I'm gonna have that moment where I can ask this man, why dad, why did you do this? Everyone knows it's premeditated. What I wanna know is why. Oh, yeah, I have told you the truth. This is a psychopath. He's believing it while he's saying it. Do you think you're a sociopath? The bigger question is, of course, what are you going as for Halloween? Well, I am Peter Pan. <laughs> this is my outfit. Gotcha. Like the kid that's never grown up. <laughs> well, you know, that does kind of fit. I think so. You sure you don't want to throw the tights in there? and No you know, tights. No tights. No, ti- no, no tights yet. At this point in my life, I have um, successfully avoided the tights for such a long time <laughs> that I think that... Um, yeah, we don't need to go tights. Okay. All right, so so back up. So they've now found another victim of John Wayne Gacy. I'm confused. So actually, they had found him. He was in the crawl space of the house. Um, but they just had not identified him. So he's gone unidentified for 40 years. And because of this new DNA processing that they're doing where they look for family members and then backtrack it from there... That's how they figured out who he was. Okay, so what is this process called? Okay, so it's genealogy. So it's it's basically like a family genealogy thing. Like, you know how you do through 23andMe or Ancestry. Sure. Very much the same thing. But I don't with, think the 23andMe, though, You anyone goes into 23andMe to say, oh, let me see if I've gotten, you know, uh, I have murderers in my family. I mean, do they? I don't know. Um, well, I don't think they're doing it for that purpose, but... Uh, I know that they found, you know, the Golden State Killer that way, doing the reverse genealogy really? type of thing. Yes, that's how they found him. Oh, interesting. Well, I want to hear more about this process. Yeah. So basically what they do is they take the DNA of either the victim or the murderer, and they make a fake profile and upload it to, you know, either Ancestry or 23andMe. And then they look for matches because immediately what happens, um, if you've never done it before, what happens is you get an email and you log into your account and you see all these people that you're related to. So, like, And we kept talking on the podcast, I'm going to do the 23andMe thing and I need to do that. You do I, need to I do need that. To, you know what happened is I got online and I started looking at the 23andMe thing. Yeah. And then it comes with like a membership and it comes with all, it, it's all these, it seemed very convoluted and it kind of put me off a little bit. Yeah, I mean... But there's a lot of, like, if you do the health one that has all the different health things that, you know, they'll ask you questions. That's really what I'm concerned about. Yeah, and it was really interesting. I did it um, mainly for the health part of things, and I found I had a brother that I didn't know about. And so that was really interesting. Um, And got to talk to him and found out that he's the only one in my family that looks like me. Yeah. Oh, looks out of my out of my siblings. Yeah. Because you're you're Native Indian and Native American. Yes. So you are. He and I looked like my dad, um, and so like my brother looks like my mom. And you look like the white man, the devil. Very much the white man. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> you also mentioned something, and I'm going to flip flop here. Sure. A, a, a rape on a train like a commute this is like a commuter this train. is a commuter train you know the train that you ride to go to work and there were you know they didn't they said there weren't dozens of people but there were enough people that could have intervened and could have stopped this assault 
and nobody did anything and they think that people took their phones out they're investigating because they said if people actually sat there and recorded it that they could um, have something criminal brought against them for recording it and not helping or doing anything i guess to alert anyone i don't know if you okay can so on hold on streams, so that's but... that's where my thing is because you mentioned this to me mm -hmm. earlier because to me right. i would think that if you are a citizen and you are filming something that is a crime being committed i mean i don't know how anybody in the right mind and this is interesting because i was discussing with my neighbor we were talking about because i live in santa monica there's a bunch of bikes being stolen you can't ride your bike anywhere if it's a nice bike people just steal it and right. they literally there's some neighborhood watch app called like neighborly or something mm -hmm. or next door next door thank yeah. you that's it and he was saying that there's videos on there of people filming people down in the venice boardwalk of criminals cutting with torches and and saws cutting bike locks off mm -hmm. but nobody does anything but here we are in the great state of pennsylvania and it, nobody stood up and did anything which is just insane to me it, it shocks me especially with all the things that we've gone through with 9 11 and with people being you know more observant of what's going on around them and at least for me if i saw it i'd probably i wouldn't think i would just act and it's probably might be a crazy thing to do at the very yeah. least one of those cell phones could have called 911. yeah something or call the train or, or whatever i'm sure when you're on a I, I haven't been on a commuter train in yeah a bajillion i don't know years, if you can get a signal but i'm sure that there are well but a commuter train is above ground yeah it's not a subway oh that's true commuter trains are above ground so you should have a signal okay so i would imagine that there's a number that says i mean i remember we're riding the subway in los angeles and had a number to call if you saw something suspicious because it was right. a suspicious package call this number i would imagine that it has that you could just say hey i'm on the 232 mm -hmm. heading west there's some guy raping you know yeah but you said so somebody did finally intervene is that correct no was it a person that was at the train station or a security number? no 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 what happened at the end like it was over and uh train stopped and someone from you know the, i guess the train station when it was walking through or whatever and it was finally reported i think that she probably reported it that she was sexually assaulted um but they were able to look at the footage because it was being you know there's it's being taped on the train itself they have cameras and so they were able to go back and identify the guy and they you know got him and arrested him he's being held in delaware you know to me it's it just shocks me that if, you know, especially if there were other men there that could have. Yeah. What are you doing, bro? Yeah. Like pinned him down or something, got him off of her. I mean, I just wonder, are people so afraid that they're going to Are they get afraid backlash? of retaliation yeah. that they're going to get canceled, that yeah. they're going to get sued, defund the police? So, yeah. oh, if you're, if you are a vigilante, you're going to. Yeah. You just don't <clears throat> know what people are thinking or what the hesitation is. Why is it that we're not helping each other and looking out for each other anymore? And I think that's, it's interesting. I had a, f a friend that runs a gun training center and we were talking one time and was talking about like the difference in like, I guess like Florida and Texas, obviously mm -hmm. Texas. Right. They're kingdom states, which means if somebody breaks down your door and comes into your house with mm -hmm. a gun and you shoot them, there's no questions asked. There's no what happened. There's, oh, they came in with a gun and threatened your family and you killed them. Bravo. Here's a medal. Whereas if that happens in a state like we live in, yeah. California, you're going to you automatically, if you shoot somebody, it doesn't matter if it was in self-defense or whatever, you're going to go to jail. Yeah. First of all, you go, you get arrested and go to jail and then they investigate while you're sitting in jail. And it doesn't matter if they broke into your home. And a lot of times these, you know, sort of uh, cases end up turning against the victim because they were defending themselves. Right. So in this case, I'm sure that people were like, well, uh, what are we supposed to do? We're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. I'm right. sure, which is what probably a lot of police officers tend to go through nowadays. Yes. Is what are we going to do? It's the same thing with the bikes, right? So let's, the cops aren't down there watching, you know, not that they're, <laughs> they're going to spend all their time watching people's bikes, but right. the fact that people are literally filming people just cutting they're not gonna they're, they're not gonna waste their time because it's like well you don't want us to do anything anymore right we're, we're damned if we do so what if we arrest this guy then he sues the department and says oh we were picking on him because he was homeless whatever or, or homeless or yeah, a minority whatever, or whatever uh we forget the fact that what they're doing is criminal 
And I think there was, you, weren't, you, weren't you saying something that there was a gun that was brought on board an airplane here at LAX? Yes, there was just something this week that uh, it sounded like a gun was brought on a plane on LAX. There was mass panic and people were stampeding each other to get off the plane and sure. some people were hurt. Yeah, it's just insane. But I'm sure, especially after 9-11, you know, they're thinking the worst um, and the fact that that could have happened in the first place. And uh, I just went to New York and... And how, toward that. How, so how does that work? How, how do you get a gun on an airplane? Was it a real gun? Was know. it like a squirt gun? I Was don't it... know. Um, it didn't have a lot of detail, but it did sound like it was an actual, it was a weapon of some sort. So, and it sounded like it was a gun. And um, I could be wrong, but from the articles that I'm reading, I was shocked and it was like CNN or something that I was reading it on. Uh, I couldn't believe that it happened. I'm like, and you know, LAX is like one of the busiest airports. LAX is like the second busiest or fifth busiest airport oh, in the world. It's wild. And it's a shame because it's so poor, <laughs> so poorly designed. It's a night. If you ever travel through LAX, you know what we're talking about. It's a nightmare. Yeah. It's a nightmare. This last weekend, I did some book signings. Yes. At Barnes and Noble. Uh, one of the books that we just did that we were doing the signing for um, our co celebrity co-author was Sharon Lecter, who was one of the creators of Rich Dad, Poor Dad with mm -hmm. or a co-creator with Rich Dad, Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki. We got to talking because this particular book is about faith. We were sitting there, one of the book signings, it was kind of slow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so she's kind of like, well, you know, she doesn't know me. And she's like, oh, so what did you write about? And I was like, well, I'm writing in this particular book series sort of my uh, story. Right. And I said, this one particular book being about faith, the chapter that I was writing, it essentially talks about when my father was arrested and I was a sole witness to the murder, right? And I testified against the grand jury, which is what allowed them to secure an indictment. And at that point in time, this was the end of January, 1990, both sides of my, my family, my mother's side of the family and my father's side of the family abandoned me for whatever their reasons right. were. I know that a lot of it was with my mother's side of the family. The The discussion was literally, you look like your father and we can't handle that. And my father's side of the family, they there was an air of like betrayal because I've testified against my father. I mean, my father's arrested. Right. And the overwhelming air of confusion over the whole thing as well. Uh, so I went into the foster care system. And I was discussing this period because I was the sole witness. The trial, I was in this sort of nightmarish foster care family and situation. And it was a period of about five and a half months where I was essentially isolated other than going to school where I would come home and I wasn't, you know, allowed to watch television because it was all over the news. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to read the paper. It was all over the newspaper, you know, I, and because it was like tainting a witness. Right. And I was describing that time I mean, look my name is collier it's a french name and so i kind of make this sort of subtle reference that right. to uh manette in a tale of two cities 105 north tower in the bastille and i was confined as well but getting into it was 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 discussing i had to be faced with this cho to this choice mm -hmm. of look if i testify against my father i run the risk that if my father gets release does it, it gets acquitted of the murder my life is over <laughs> essentially you know i you can't testify against your father and then think that that's going to go unpunished or mm -hmm. un or forgotten about or whatever he's going to make my life a living hell right on the flip side my father goes to prison i have no family anyways and it was really finding the faith in myself or finding out what faith was and it's not a religion or anything like that, because that's not what I discovered. It wasn't like, oh, I found Jesus or Buddha or whatever that, that caught me through this. No, it, it was what I found was faith is that faith, you know, uh, is something you find in yourself. And my chapter is called Finding Faith in the Nader, right? So the right. Nader being the low point of your existence. And really, you know, there's a great, great quote, and I, I can't remember the, the actor's name. It's in the movie Wall Street. And he says... He's saying to the character um, that uh, Charlie Sheen plays, mm -hmm. his name is Bud Fox. Okay. And he grabs him, and, he, and I can see the actor, and I, I can't remember, he's a very famous actor. He grabs him, and this is right before he's going to get arrested by the FBI for insider trading. And he says, Bud, he goes, 
man looks into the abyss and when he sees nothing staring back at him it's at that moment that man finds his character and that's what keeps him out of the abyss so i think that when you're faced with just to dive into the heavy shit yes (laughs) i think that when you're faced with these challenges that call into question what faith really is is you are staring back at nothing. <laughs> There's nothing staring back at you. Right. And you have to either really make a decision. And one of the things that Sharon was saying to me is she said, you know, you stood your ground when most people wouldn't. And you were a twelve year old child. And it kind of segued into this because we were we were we were discussing sociopathy and and one of the things I was talking about is uh and she was related, she works with a, a children's uh charity for foster kids. And I said, you know, one of the things that I thought was the most was the craziest and and tragic um, events of the pandemic is for myself, right? Being able to go to school, at least that was the only thing I had was the sort of reprieve to what was going on in my life is to at least go to school. And for a lot of people going to schools and, oh, well, I get to go to school. That doesn't sound too fun. But I started thinking, well, these kids that are in abusive situations, abusive homes, growing up that they're, only reprieve from that abuse yeah. is to go to school is to be around friends in school in the classroom even though it's only a short part of their day right that gets them out of the home from the abuser but then you think about covid and the pandemic and not being able to get being away being able to get away for children who are in abusive situations for spouses you know husbands and wives yeah. for partners uh it's it's a, it's really heavy shit to think about. And that was kind of our really wonderful, <laughs> very odd conversation that we were having while we we're waiting to sign, <laughs> sign books. Very uplifting. But, but real. I mean, there I is. think that they're, you know, the, it's authentic. It's an authentic, real conversation about this is, this is the circumstances that we're dealing with in these situations. And, you know, we, last week we touched upon the, Gabby Petito case, and there's been another. Well, he, he they found his body. They found his body. Yep, they found his body, and he was uh, had his notebook with him, um, all of that. And apparently, they think that he was probably dead, like early on, like right when he took off. Um, the police had been follow, thought they were following him, but they were actually following his mother. They got confused, so they think that he was dead the en- entire time. You know, self inflicted. Um, but I mean, on a positive note, if you can even give it one, they did find three other bodies of missing people during the search for Gabby and for him. So when they found these other bodies, like, were they from other cases or were they from him? No, they were from other cases. It wasn't like he was a murderer. I think that honestly, I think they had a very passionate relationship, volatile young love kind of thing that, you know, and the things that I'm hearing is that there was some control issues um, on his part of her, like he started to become more controlling. And when he couldn't control her, I think he snapped. And I think that's just what ended up happening. And I honestly feel like, yeah, there's probably a lot of remorse there because he did love her. and, And, you know, in the end he killed himself over it. And it's just really unfortunate. But um, no, these other people... But did he kill her? Yes, he did. He did kill her. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He he strangled her. She was strangled. But they did find these other people. One was uh, someone they thought had taken his own life. He was from Texas, but he was found in Wyoming. Uh, Another lady that had been missing. I don't quite know what her story was. And then uh, a homeless man... Um, that um, I think had been missing as well. Maybe he had some family. But yeah, it's amazing how many people are out there. And if you think about just the national parks alone, how many people have either gone up there to commit suicide or how many people have been murdered that they haven't found their bodies. I hear so many stories, um, you know, because I'm a crime podcast person in the national the park stories. park yeah. oh yeah and the national park thing especially i'm not going hiking anytime soon anywhere <laughs> no thank you i'm good 
I have never been to Yosemite and I want to go so badly, but now you're we'll go with a group. And I want to go by myself with my camera. Mm, I want to, no. Angela, I want to mm-hmm. Angel Adams it. Mm-hmm. I want moon over half dome. Nope. That's what I want. I'm not coming to look for your body, sir. It's no, you're not going by yourself. Last we heard of him. <laughs> oh geez. Yeah, no, I'm not going to go and get a search party and look for you falling off a cliff somewhere. You need to take people with you. The other thing that I thought was really interesting this week, and I didn't bring this up, but um, there was a murder on the Chandler path in Burbank. A murder on the Chandler bike path? Murder on the Chandler bike path. Apparently there was a drug dealer um, whose name was Richard Dick. Yes, Dick Dick. Um, With a name like Dick Dick, you know, things are going to go sideways. But he was riding, he rides his bike and I guess sells drugs or something on the Chandler path and then shot somebody. Yeah. Okay, hold on. So for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> so Burbank is a very, if you've seen Pleasantville, yes. Burbank is very much like Pleasantville, yes. right? It Wouldn't is. Say? Beautiful, clean. Clean and don't park on our street. Here's a parking sign because we don't like riffraff coming. I yes. literally had friends in Burbank. They, there. I remember that there was like this... <laughs> makeup or like sneaker store that opened up in their neighborhood and they were (laughs) they were very upset because people were coming into the neighborhood and parking in their neighborhood from you know south central los angeles and all these places that they were like oh and mind you that these people are very woke and very uh liberal mm-hmm. and oh we're we're very conscious but they didn't really want those people in the neighborhood it's so interesting with people it's like mm-hmm. oh when it comes to your neighborhood then you have an issue oh yes but we can talk about everyone else that's right so they had this issue with these makeup so they petitioned to get these signs so that's the kind of neighborhood and they were right by the chandler bike path mm-hmm. and so, so imagining this guy pedaling around up and down the bike path with this little bag of drugs Did they even say what kind of drugs it was uh, what kind of, uh, oh, no, I don't know. I have no idea what he sold, but uh, a friend of mine was telling me the probably story. Probably math, because if he's on his bike and he's like, Aah! yeah, probably. He's all, he's all. Could be, who knows? So my friend was like, yeah, you, you might want to read this article before you, because I was always talking about going and walking on the, the bike path, because I, it's a great place to like walk. It's amazing. Everyone oh, I lives in the valley, I used to yeah, do it all the time. Yeah, or take your dogs or whatever. Because so it, it goes all the way down to Warner Center, which is like out in Woodland Hills, for those of you that are. Yeah not familiar with it. it's like Burbank is on one end and then it yeah. goes out to like Warner Center which is yeah and it's great it's, about, it's like 18 miles or something yeah it goes for. And, you know people roller skate and do everything on there but but of course I had to be a smart ass when he was telling me about this and you know you better be careful and I'm like so what you're saying is when I go to the Chandler path I need to bring cash yeah exactly to buy drugs like, I mean <laughs> I knew it was that easy. Right? Just go to a bike path? So I just need to bring cash is what you're saying. I mean, but no. That was just crazy. I'm like, you're on a bike. Someone gets murdered. Wild. That was wild. And so anyway, that just happened this last week. So did they catch? They, I'm assuming they caught Oh, yeah. They got dick. the guy. Dick Dick. They got Dick Dick. Because there's cameras everywhere. From what I see, Because you stop at the yeah. stoplight. There's like, you can't make oh, the yeah. left. And you got to wait for it and all that. So yeah, they got Dick Dick on camera. They got Dick Dick. Dick Dick <sighs> is done. He is arrested. Was he a Burbank resident, I wonder? I would imagine so if he's driving riding his bike around. He probably lived with his mom or something. I'm pretty sure. Why do drug dealers have to live with their mom? I don't know, but I they do. I think that's, a, that's an unfair stereotype. I don't know, but I think that was the story. I think he lived with his mom. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I, we don't have much time to get into this, but <laughs> I have you seen The Love Fraud on Showtime? No. And it was a documentary that came out in 2020. It was called The Love Fraud. Okay. And it's about a sociopath. And this guy, he he had online profiles and he would get married to women and then run up, you know, they would buy a house somewhere or they would buy cars or they would invest in a business or then he would date them and then he would get involved with them and then he would date someone else but he was married to multiple people at the same time. And it was about this hunt to catch this guy. It was just spending over four episodes, and you and I have talked many times about dating apps and things like that, and, and it's Ugh. no secret that uh, my success rate with these social <laughs> dating platforms it is, is, not, is gone not It is not a positive experience. We still have to do the episode where I discuss all of my tales of being yeah. interviewed, uh, going on these dates, and then it turns into a true crime interview with me, right. and then I get to pick up the check. That's the 
that's the best part. It's like, like you, what just happened? Like, let's just talk about all the traumatic shit you have in your life. Call your, oh, and by the way, thanks for dinner. Yeah. And I'm like, this was fun. That's what, this was so great. And they're like, oh, do you want to get together again? I'm like, are you high? S- yeah. They're, they, they go see Dick Dick. They're Dick Dick customers. Ah, uh, That's gotcha. what they are. <laughs> that probably doesn't sound very good since we were talking about dating yet, but anyways. Yeah. Um, anyway. They, <laughs> but this, so this guy was, would constantly get in these, these marriages and then, he would go, you know, buy a car, buy this and that. And I swear to God, I'm listening to it. And, and he would have these like stories of, that he would tell these women. I'm like, this is my father. This was my father. Like literally this was it. And this guy didn't kill anyone or do anything like that, but he did ruin their lives. Like, you know, some of these women, you know, 250, $350, $500,000 worth of stuff. I don't know how you get to a point. I mean, obviously he's a predator, right? He's a sociopath. He's a predator. And he gets these women into situations where they're just spending money on him. And it's, and it's also not like this guy was like, you look at him and be like, Oh, he's handsome. Cause let me tell you something. I've had many friends in my life, uh, that live on their good looks, you know, <laughs> former Chippendales or models and stuff like that. And then they have, relationships and they have admirers and things like that and then women buy them watches and cars and it's whatever i i don't get it this was this guy but he but take away the chip and dale's good looking mm-hmm. element and it's just, they just fell into his stories and the it, manipulation is it's amazing insane. the people that can manipulate people and think it's okay to get them to buy them things and to take care of them and to but here's the crazy part that reminds me of my father not only the behavior because my father would do this right the crazy part for me, they finally catch him. Mm-hmm. They basically, all these women get together on this social media board. Uh, not like a, I don't know what it was, but some forum. They were all talking about this guy. And he went by different names. But he was saying like kind of the same area. It was like St. Louis. It's like Midwestern. All the, mm-hmm. Of course, all the random crazy shit happens in the Midwest, right? And Florida, of course. Don't forget Florida. And Florida. <laughs> all Florida. <laughs> Like three of them got together and found this bounty hunter, like um, woman that was like in in the St. Louis area, and she was she was like, "I'll do it for free." Wow! Yeah, because she was a you know she would go hunt down people that jump bail and things like that. That's what she did. But she was you know like, "Oh yeah, I'll do this for free," because you know, fuck this guy. Yeah. Because she just heard and she and she's like, "I hate when men do this. Like mm-hmm. they, we need to make an example of this guy." So she ended up, they all kind of sleuthed it out together. It was really crazy. It was like five group, a group of five women and this bounty hunter that all just put the pieces, but they catch him. And he's in the, the documentary filmmakers get an interview with him in prison or in jail. Okay. And, and cause he was essentially had been found guilty on a couple of different things and then, uh, you know, jumped bail or jumped and didn't jump bail, did, um, just violated his probation and came when it left the state or whatever and, and didn't show back up in court, things like that. So he had a warrant out for his arrest. So they ended up getting him, but he was only arrested for like six months. He was only in car- he never went to prison or anything like that. Spoiler alert. He's in jail trying to defend himself to the these women that are making the documentary. And I swear to God, it's just like my father. He's got like this story, and you can tell that he's believing it, but his eyes are blinking like really fast. And he's like, because you know he's making it all up in his head. Mm-hmm. He's like, I just don't understand why I really just want love. And they're like, okay, so how many different women were you married to at once? Oh, I was only married to one, two of them at the same time once. Well, what about this person? And then this person, this, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I forgot about her. Oh yeah. It just, it, I think the mm-hmm. whole thing unravels, but he's just so, yeah. Like my father It's so creepy. So you have to watch that. The okay. love fraud on I'm, showtime. I wrote it down and we can discuss it. Okay. And you will feel, the moral of the story is you will feel so much better about your online dating after watching this. After watching this, the it's fact that amazing. I have not run into this guy yet. Precisely. And don't want to. And don't want to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, that is all the time we have. Okay. I'm Collier Landry. And I'm Brenda Fisher. And this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. The 
film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today.